bar, they would immediately call me. And it occurred to me, look, this is a stupid added layer of security. That's security in depth. It needn't be super smart, but it can be highly effective. Uh, I like to think of this as, it's very slow, okay, as seatbelt. So we all use seatbelts when we drive a car. Everybody knows that a seatbelt is no silver bullet. People are dying in car accidents despite the seatbelt, but everybody is wearing them because we think, given the small hassle, it has a big security value. So you have your fairly strong vehicle and you drive securely, but as an additional security or safety device, you put on a seatbelt. It's no total uh, total solution, but it helps you survive an accident. And coming back to application security, uh, mod security, and the call rule set, is an additional layer of security. It's not meant to be a silver bullet. It's not meant to be protect you 100% when you have an extremely broken application. But it adds a bit of security on top for re relatively low hassle. What's my plan for tonight? I'm going to introduce you to WAFs a bit, so web application firewalls, mod security, the call rule set. I'll show you a small demo how you can install it. It'll be very brief because installation is so simple. And then I'll introduce you to a few core concepts of the call rule set rules and then I'll show you how to go from here when you return to your day job. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. So web application firewalls. A web application firewall is a device or a software <coughs> that sits on the edge of, a, of your network, on a service, and it inspects the traffic coming into to the server and going out from the server to the client. That's the basic concept. And it tries to understand the traffic a bit and to block malign traffic while letting vanilla or benign traffic pass. So it wants to make a cut between the attackers and the legitimate users. Unlike a network firewall, which is extremely simple here, which is a network firewall does many of its static inspe uh, traffic inspection, but usually just this port is open, this port is blocked. That's a very simple to configure. But an application is highly complicated. So compl uh, setting up a web application firewall is usually quite difficult to do. Uh, so it's, it has a similar name to a network firewall, but it's much more complex. Uh, you can argue, of course, that wouldn't it be better to actually fix the code tend to try to protect it with an additional measure? And I think, yeah, it would be a lot better if people would write secure code. But if the last one here is a web, Web secure thought is one thing that it is that writing secure code is extremely hard and fixing broken code code seems to be even harder still. And one measure against this, if you don't really, really trust yourself to write secure code, is adding more security in front of it or behind or around or multiple layers, do an, an onion setup for your security because there will be holes and all the security layers combined will help you protect you. Uh, so uh, web application firewalls are uh, recommended by the PCI DSS standard. Uh, that's probably why everybody hates, uh, or a lot of people hate buffs. Uh, PCI made it a highly commercial area. So a lot of commercial companies went into this field, developed uh, web application firewall, that is a very hard competition, a very fierce competition. There is a lot of hype, there's a lot of uh, sales going on, and also a lot of fad and uh, uncapped promises. Uh, I would say uh, web application firewall setups boil down in three categories. Oh, this, is, it's this has a lag. <laughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> Good. So they go down in three variants. The biggest group of them are naive installations, if you ask me. Naive installations is somebody told them, like PCI told them, you need a buff. So they would buy a shiny box, hand it over to the system administrator, and then have a green check mark on the report. We have a buff now. That's a naive installation. If it's super naive, it's not even plugged. 
often it's plugged, but it's disabled. <laughs> it's out of band. It's in monitoring mode. Nobody looks at the logs. It doesn't have any security at all. That's very typical. Uh, the smaller groups is the overwhelmed groups. These are assistant administrators. They actually try to work them off. So they have this shiny product and they enable it and then they're overwhelmed. There is an avalanche of reports and false positives and uh, real positives and lots of logs and then you, they click through the GUI and there's so many check marks to do and all inco very incomprehensible. It's really hard. And they try to make their way, but of course they, they get the box, but they don't get the resources to use it. So they need to somehow squeeze in the time, and they, they try to do it. And if, they, if they're really adventurous, and after a couple of weeks, they sometimes try to enable it, and actually put it in blocking mode, and then there are two scenarios what's going to happen. The, the simple scenario, the, the nice scenario is the customer's block. And the customer uh, calls in, and they try, they, they likely figure out they have to disable this <laughs> because the business is affected. The not so nice scenario is the boss calls in because he has been blocked and he's really upset. And most system administrators will stop using the buff afterwards. They will not dare to put it in blocking mode anymore. And the final group uh, is the functional web setup, and that is, uh, it's a bit of a rare species. I wouldn't say, go as far as to say a uh, functional web is as rare as a unicorn, but it's a mythical animal. <laughs> uh, so you have big commercial products uh, which do not really, really live up to the promise, or are much harder in production than what they mean to be, uh, or what you've been told or they just don't have very sharp teeth. So they do a bit of security, but they're not really uh, blocking a, a good attacker. Uh, somehow it seems uh, that most buffs are commercial. So open source people somehow don't really like the concept. This boils down to there is a single, uh, a single open source web application firewall, and it's been around for like 15 years now, and this is not security. Uh, what is not security? It is no super modern artificial intelligence, machine learning, super hard, uh, cloud enabled mastermind. It's much more like a Swiss watch. Maybe that's why I'm fitting to do more security. It, it is a mechanical swatch in the sense that it gives you very fine granular control on the request level, on parameters, headers, uh, the URI, the response. You can look into the request in detail and you can filter anything you want and block it or let it pass. But you need to do this all yourself or you need rules to do this. It's not going to learn it by itself like the commercial, some of the commercial counterparts. You need to teach it, you need to configure it or have a good configuration which does this for you. Uh, so mod security is like the only real open source offering on the market. There are small uh, single purpose WAFs so like uh, Naxi on Nginx, but it's, the functionality is much more limited. So we like to think of mod security as an all purpose WAF. It, it can do anything web for you. Uh, so that's mod security. That is the engine. But then you need the rules. These are, these are really two separate things. You have the web server, you build mod security on top, and then comes the configuration in the forms of rules. And the rules is a different project. And this is where OWASP comes in. So the OWASP mod security core rule set. It's a set of rules. And it's the most widespread set of rules that is being used with mod security. It also has a very cool release poster. <laughs> so this is uh, CRS3, came out last winter, and this is the core part of my uh, presentation. What is CRS3? What are the features? What are the core concepts? What can it do for you? Um, CRS3 is a 10-year-old project which was uh, launched by Ofrish Zaf from Israel. It was afterwards taken over uh, by Ryan Burnett from the States, 
And then it died down a bit after 2010 or 12. And in 2015, it was uh, revived by Kay Sanders and uh, a guy named Walter Hoff from the Netherlands and me. So we're a new core team of three, three guys. And we recruited four or five additional developers in the meantime. We brought out CRF3 last winter, so the first major release in uh, four or five years. And this is really a, a relaunch or a, a big rewrite of the whole rule set. So the, the project is back to life. It's alive and kicking. We're developing new rules. We're fixing holes. And we're uh, venturing into new directions with the rule set. Uh, now would be uh, demo time. And the last time uh, when I gave this presentation, they, they didn't like my notebook. I thought London was nicer with me, but they didn't like my notebook either. So this time I'm prepared. And we're going to run, yeah, just play. I say. Play. We're going to run a video which helps me uh, comment it. So we're going to install the mod security core rule set. You can download it uh, from the OWASP website. Oh, the OWASP website, see where you get it. So this is the OWASP uh, page of the project. Again, uh, the poster. And there are a couple of tutorials included. Actually, these are the, the official tutorials which I wrote. Here, it gives it URL. We paste it into the shell. We're downloading it. We're untarring the latest version. We, we enter the folder. And then we have a, a setup conf example, which we simply copy, and we don't even touch it. And then we start a new Apache. I'm working with Apache a lot, so I have a script to do this. This starts me a new Apache configuration. <laughs> and in here, we simply include this setup, uh, this setup file. And then on the second line, we include the rules. So the setup is the basic configuration. And the rules, obviously, the rule files. I save this. Then I launch the, Apa launch the Apache web server. Go to the browser. Now running a local host. And that's the basic uh, Apache. It just tells you that it's here. And now we're adding uh, an attacking query string. This looks attacking. I don't have the vulnerability, so we cannot ex exploit this. But it, it looks like exec being bashed. So that might be a common injection attack. And mod security is blocking it immediately. So this was the whole installation. Uh, to give you the whole uh, call rule set. can be as simple as that nowadays. This is the default installation. Uh, whatever, everything which comes afterwards is adding more security or give you more granular control. And now we look at the error log of this request. That's very hard to read. Uh, we pipe it through uh, an alias, which extracts uh, the individual alerts. And what was detected here is a remote command execution, Unix shell code file. So the bin bash was Unix shell code file. And this is actually this alert here. He detected a bin bash on the argument exec. And uh, that's more or less it. So this is the basic. So let's go back. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. This has been uh, the basic installation. And you can, uh, I mean, uh, bin bash as an exec uh, variable is, is fairly simple. Uh, what does really work? So does this really bring you any form of protection? Uh, uh, you need to look at this uh, 
uh, with the help of some tools, because I, I, can, I can tell you, yeah, this helps, but uh, does it really help in real life? I'm doing, or did a bit of research uh, with Damiano Esposito from the University of Applied Sciences in Zurich, and what, uh, what we did is we would use a verb to attack uh, Wafset. Uh, Wafset is a vulnerable application, like the Choose Shop, uh, which has been mentioned. Uh, Wafset is a web application vulnerability scanner evaluation project. So that is an application which exposes a lot of vulnerabilities and is meant to gauge the effectiveness of BURP or SAP or any other sort of uh, attack scanner. It is meant to tell you how many of the vulnerabilities is BURP actually discovering. <laughs> so, and each bar here is based on four and a half million requests. Here is the no protection bar. So we installed this, uh, this uh, older application and then attacked it with BURP. Uh, Damiano, Damiano Esposito, who done, done this with me, he made his master in vulnerability scanners. So he's like the burp scanner mastermind. He takes, uh, he takes the best, all the hardest or most advanced features out of burp, assemble them in a, in a pack of four and a half million requests, and we attacked uh, this application. And burp uh, reported to us that it thinks that close to 1,100 of its requests actually hit the vulnerability without any protection in between. And the default installation of mod security with CRI3, this has been the installation which you have seen. This is a vanilla installation we've just done in the video. Brought this down to, uh, what is the number, 185. So like 80% of the vulnerabilities are gone or hidden now. They're no longer, no longer exposed with this simple default installation. So that's the effectiveness. What does this really mean in the categories? Uh, the default install would not work on uh, the open redirects uh, we were talking about. Uh, remote file uh, inclusion doesn't really help. Uh, local file inclusion, extremely effective. Cross-site scripting, quite effective. s conjection really, really effective. And that's only the that's only the default install. It's not the advanced high security setup. Uh, uh, so when uh, we did this, uh, like in May, we had the first result. I was really feeling like, wow, we we, we kind of solved the S conjunction problem, didn't we? And then, unfortunately, uh, we were challenged by an American guy, uh, uh, Ivan Novikov, and I set up a bet with him that I would offer a cake if he managed to pass uh, an S injection. And he did, and I lost my cake. <laughs> what the guy did, uh, he was able to develop an SQL injection in seven characters without any white space. And he defeated us. Uh, like, uh, it was embarrassing. But, uh, and it looked so elegant, and I think he must be really smart. <laughs> and what happened is, uh, and that is a general WAF problem. So to mod security, Nicole said, this looked really innocent. It didn't even have white space. How can you do an, in, an injection without white space? How, how, do, how would you tell the arguments apart? But he used uh, something, and that's the basic problem, uh, and we call this impedance mismatch. So what mod security thinks is a white space is not necessarily what my SQL thinks is a white space. So we thought this was benign, and the backend would execute it. And that's the basic problem, which brings us back to this is only an additional layer of security. This is not a silver bullet. And even if I have wet dreams about uh, fighting SQL injections, 100%, this could be a false sense of security. It's only helping so and so far. And you still need other means of security. But by default, it defeats burp. And that's already something, isn't it? <laughs> Good. Uh, Again. So what are we actually doing uh, uh, in these core rule sets? These are the rule files that we uh, included. When we did include asterisk.conf, these were the files we were including. Uh, the files have numbers. This corresponds uh, loosely to rule ideas. Uh, mod security rules always have an ID. And now you know about which ID should be in which file. 
the filings are speaking. So we have method enforcement, we have scanner detection rules, we have protocol enforcement. That's really important because most web servers are, they're really like hippies. Well, let's say they're quite liberal when it comes to enforcing HTTP standards. And uh, mod security is mu or the call rules that are much more stricter. So if you send an HTTP request which is not standard compliant, like you miss out the user agent, this is illegal. Mod security or call rules that will complain. Or, this is not standard compliant, a browser will always send it a user agent. And if you're not sending a user agent, they're likely not a browser, and it's very likely we don't want to see you on this server. So that's what we're doing. We're much more strict than a standard web server. Protocol attacks, and then of course the SQL injection rules, the cross-site scripting rules, remote command execution, remote file inclusion, local file inclusions, PHP attacks, you name them. So that's a set of over a hundred rules split over all these files. And the request I used to do in the demo uh, triggered three separate alerts. One was uh, uh, in here, remote command execution, and then one was in this file. That's the blocking evaluation. So the rule which triggered didn't block immediately. That's a core concept in here. It would just <coughs> write a message, and then we do an evaluation at the end, which gives us a bit more leverage in what to exactly do and how we want to behave. We're not blocking immediately, but we make an educated decision at the end what we want to do. That's a core concept. And then there has been a third alert, but that was only for statistics. Uh, so the, the biggest number of uh, rules are, of course, request based, but we also have response uh, rules. We're, we're, uh, we're a bit behind here in the sense that uh, we have data leakages and uh, error messages uh, that we want to detect, and this is a bit outdated. So one of the findings of the burp research uh, I did uh, with my colleague was there were error messages which we didn't detect in the response. And uh, all combined, actually, we issued uh, 13 bug reports to our own project. So there were 13 things which we think the coral set should have caught, and it didn't. And uh, quite a few of them have been uh, error messages which were simply updated and we didn't notice. So we need to work on that. And uh, yeah, we're coming now to the second uh, demo. And uh, given the uh, computer doesn't like my notebook, we need to do this. Uh, by hand, I need your help to do this. And uh, uh, first, we need an attacker. And uh, okay. uh, do we have somebody with a hoodie? Attackers are always wearing hoodies. <laughs> <laughs> Who has a hoodie? Well, they have long hair. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, I'll have to you have you have a hoodie with? Hey, he has his hoodie here. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I'm not regretting this at all. <laughs> What's your name? You're running. Uh, nice to meet you. You are very good. Please put this on and put the hoodie up. That's very important for the demo. Uh, and then we need five additional people. Uh, you're going to be the defenders. You don't need a hoodie. <laughs> Who wants to come up? Uh, Sam, you, you already know the deal. Uh, who else wants to come? Sherry? Okay. Come on, come on, come on. Very good, thank you. We need number five. Come on, volunteers. Come on. Michelle, okay. Very good. We take the tallest guys at the end. Yeah. <laughs> You're tall, step over. Sam, come here. Yeah, Michelle. Okay. Could you, uh, you need a bit of, uh, of approach. Uh, go to the end, give them a bit of room. Very good. And. Uh, could you line up here, please, uh, next to each other? <coughs> Very good. Okay, and you go sideways. You stand here, and would you come to the front? <laughs> like this. Okay. What we're having here now, uh, I'm lacking one of these. So these three nice people are our rules. Sam is the SQL injection rule. 
Sharif is going to be, he's going to check for missing headers. He, Sam has five points to give. Missing headers is less severe. Sharif gets only two points to give. And Michelle is going to look for cross-site scripting. So they represent a, se a selection of the 150 or 180 rules that we have in the rule set. And then the, the final rules, which makes the blocking decisions represented with these two nice gentlemen. <laughs> Could you stand apart a bit and come a wee bit further to the front? Exactly, because you guys are actually defending the fridge. <laughs> so the fridge, these are our sets we want to protect with the coral set. I think that's yeah. a nice setup. <laughs> and our detector Radu wants here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he didn't pay. <laughs> so the default installation would now be fairly low. That's the default installation, what we did. But if you do a real setup and you want to be really sure that you don't have legitimate customers block, you usually start, and I advocate this, you start with a very high limit. Oops, sorry, you go really high. And by going really high and trying this out, you are already in a blocking mode, but you're quite sure that nobody will be blocked. And this is a very important concept, which I advocate in my courses. You want to start in blocking, but without actually blocking anybody. Because if you, if you start in monitoring mode and you tune everything, you will never dare to put your lever into blocking. But when you start in, uh, in blocking mode with a very uh, easy limit, then lowering the limit a bit is a very small step. And we try this out now. So Radu is approaching the fridge. He's an HTTP request. Sam is now looking at the request and decides if Radu looks like an SQL injection or not. <laughs> you think yeah. he is? Uh, then put the tag on his back. <laughs> OK. Good. Then you approach Sharif. Go to the next rule. And he thinks he's even missing a header. That's a stupid attack. Rather, you need to improve it. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle, uh, does he on top of it look like you know, cross-site scripting? Uh, you think so. So he approaches the limit. Now, keep it really up. And he passes underneath. Despite the 17 points we has, he passes underneath. But he has alerted three rules. So he has triggered three rules. And we're now going to tune it a bit and see, oh, look, here is a real attack here. And the legitimate user are all passing in the next iteration. Sorry, you can go to the start again. <laughs> in the next iteration, as we have grown in confidence, we're now lowering the bar. Let's say we go down to the default installation. And rather does his attack again, probably the same attack with because it works the last time. And he's getting the same tags again. And this time, he is likely blocked. <laughs> and and that, that is the integration uh, of the coral set. We're lowering the bar. And what you've seen in action is a scoring mechanism. So all the rules executing are adding scores. And at the end, the 949 rule is evaluating the score and deciding, do we let him pass? or not. And the, the threshold can be defined by yourself. By default, it's just fairly low on a 5. But you can put it anywhere you want to. And uh, what I do in my mod security courses is uh, showing in detail how you work through these iterations and how you can make an educated decision where the good limit should be at a given moment so you can make sure that no legitimate customer is ever blocked. And that's what you ultimately <coughs> want. You want to be really sure what's going to happen when you lower the bar. Thank you, guys. So this was the limbo dancing uh, demo. 
verb again. Next basic concept. We had the scoring, and now we do paranoia levels. Uh, the basic installation gave you 150 rules. And what we, what we actually did, we installed the core rule set in paranoia level one. So what is a paranoia level? We divided the rules into fairly sane rules, the default installation, and then in higher paranoia levels, you're getting more rules. And these rules are a bit more paranoid. They're a bit more crazy. With craziness and paranoia comes more misjudgments and false decisions. This results in false positives. What is a false positive? A guarding dog biting the mailman is a false positive. A customer blocked by mod security is a false positive. You don't want to have this. You want to make sure the customers are not affected. And ultimately, your boss is never blocked when he tests the size of that. That's what you really want to make sure. Uh, in the level one, we really, really paid attention to have none or as little as possible false positives. When you enable this, what we have done in the first demo is there shouldn't be any false positive. If you encounter a false positive in the default installation, please issue a bug report. We want to know notice. We want to fix this. A default installation shouldn't raise any uh, false positives. It shouldn't block you at all. In paranoia level two, you have to encounter them now and then. Paranoia level three, there will be more of them, quite a few actually. And paranoia level four, there's going to be a lot of false positives. And all the false positives need to be handled by you. So this starts easy and gets harder and harder the, the higher the paranoia level. Yes? Is there, is there any real difference to paranoia level two and three? Yes, I'm going, coming back to this because you see the problem, the issue here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we like to think of these uh, paranoia levels as levels of security. Uh, the default installation is a minimal baseline every web application should have. And that's what our idea is. Uh, it's CRS for everyone. Uh, and it should come with, uh, with your hosting plan or your basic setup, just like nowadays HTTPS or less encrypt certificates, they're included. And we think the CRS3 should be included in a default uh, paranoia level one. In two, you realize that you have real assets and you want a bit more rules, a bit better protection. And here you have to look at it more careful and you'll encounter a few false positives which you need to handle. In paranoia level three, you actually have true assets and you need real security, even if so far there's no much difference here. And in paranoia level four, it's just the highest level. I'm working on an e-voting project in Switzerland and we're running in paranoia level four. And it's just very hard. But uh, we think uh, it's a added, good added value for the money. Uh, so uh, when we looked at the Burp research, uh, he, he did over 1,000 or identified over 1,000 vulnerable uh, requests or requests uh, triggering accessing a vulnerability. And only five of them made it through paranoia level four. So what are these five? These are mostly out of band communication. So the application would issue a parameter, and the vulnerable application would take the parameter and do a DNS lookup. So that's out of band, and Burp would then encounter, oh look, it has done the DNS lookup. It is out of band communication. And for us, uh, with Coddle set, it's extremely hard to do, because we would need to identify a parameter as a potential host name, which can be used in DNS lookup. So that is going to be extremely hard to protect from that. And maybe that's, a bit, that's beyond, uh, beyond reason to expect Coral set to protect from that. Uh, so we have what we think are four security levels in the Coral set. And uh, the role of the security officers uh, amongst you or in your organization will be to take the threat model of your services and map them to a security level. So if it's just the feedback uh, form, it's probably very low. But if you're an online bank, then you should likely be in this region with your services. It really depends on your threat model and the value of your assets and the resources that you can spend. And uh, mind you, if you're raising the paranoia level, 
you need more and more resources to integrate the service. That's obvious. So if you're a security officer, assign a higher security level or a paranoia level to a service, you need to make sure that people actually get the resources to handle the false positives, to, uh, to set this up accordingly. So this paranoia level, what does this mean in practice? Uh, this is what I ex explained. Uh, let's say basic security, elevated security, online banking level, and the nuclear power plant security. Somebody working in nuclear power plant? OK, we've been lucky. I have a guy, uh, a friend of mine who, oh, actually, he, he's, a, he's a cousin of mine. We're actually related now. So he works in nuclear power plant and said the only reason we don't have internet connection in the central steering unit is the time we built this, it was not invented. <laughs> but they're, they're fixing this problem now. They're bringing in the internet into the central theory. Uh, makes me a bit afraid. <laughs> uh, so these are paranoia levels. Uh, let's look at the protocol enforcement rules. That's the biggest uh, group of rules we have. And the default, we do 31 rules. Elevated, additional 7. Paranoia level 3, only one additional rule. That's the issue here. So this level has very few rules, fewer than we have in mind. This is a development area. We want more rules to have in here. And then paranoia level four. Uh, we have a couple of rules and that's actually good enough because they're extremely basic and extremely aggressive. They look to, uh, at special characters. This can be seen on the next slide. Uh, within this uh, Paranoia levels is the concept of stricter siblings. Uh, we'll look at byte by range enforcement. So that's within the protocol rules. At level, paranoia level one, uh, we have a rule 920 to 70, which allows full ASCII range without the null character. So that's almost everything is okay in the default installation. At the level two, uh, we say you can have the visible range plus the tab and the new line. But this is now a bit more restricted. All the steering characters are now off. Paranoia level three, we go to the visible lower ASCII range, so that's up to 127, without the percent sign, because it's used for encoding. And then in paranoia level four, it's just a whitelist of a few characters which are okay by now. The cool thing about the Eskimo injection seven characters was he was able to do this with these characters. And that was really cool. I didn't expect that. <laughs> uh, so that's, so that's the, the concept. If you look at the rule ideas, you see that they are related. So when you look uh, at an alert and you see the rule idea, you already know a bit of the family this is coming from when you work with these rules. So there is somehow a group, and uh, we do this a lot in the core rules. We have strict siblings, so like families working together, and there is a basic rule, and then it has a few tough relatives which go stricter and stricter and stricter. And what will actually happen here uh, is accumulation. If you do a null character, it will trigger this one, this one, this one, this one. So in paranoia level four, you could say the null character would trigger four rules, giving him 20 scores. He's immediately across the uh, top of the roof in paranoia level four. That's a typical effect. The scores get very high very quickly. I'm through here. Uh, and this, uh, so this is, uh, this was the scoring. We do, uh, we have 150 rules in the basic installation, then like 30 more in the paranoia level 2, uh, 10 or 50 more in paranoia level 3, and a couple of them in paranoia level 4. We can do scoring, we can do paranoia level, so this is our leverage how to steer the things. These are basic concepts. Uh, but if you have an existing service and, uh, and think about uh, mod security, most people are afraid. I re ask your friend and he will tell you, look, I've set up mod security and it killed my site. Either performance or because it would block legitimate traffic. And we think this is a real problem for established sites. Bringing in mod security is, 
it's an adventure and it uh, could be risky. Uh, I've now written the book and I did extensive research uh, on performance and mod security will easily eat like 5 or 10 percent of your throughput just going into regular expressions uh, thanks to mod security. So uh, we help you uh, with uh, the sampling mode. What is the sampling mode? Uh, a sampling mode is meant to get your feet wet a bit with a uh, mod security and call rule set. So you enable mod security, you enable the call rules, but only on n percent of the requests. And if you go, if you have a lot of traffic, say uh, a million uh, hits per day, if there is a lot, just need has probably more. Uh, <coughs> And you say, I'm only doing looking at 1% of the requests, then you can be quite sure the server will not break down under the load because it's just 1% of the request, 99% of the requests will bypass the rule set. So nothing really bad can happen. And even if it blocks uh, your requests, only 1% of them will be blocked. So this is really easy to get your feet wet and make sure you're not overwhelmed with all the false positives, with all the locks, performance loss. <coughs> That's a good way to ease into it. And then as you grow in confidence, you raise the percentage. And at a given moment, you're quite confident whatever comes now must be very rare. Because if it would be frequent or often or a rude problem, you would have encountered it by now. And again, as when we lower the anomaly limit, this is an iterative process. You enable it a bit. You let it run for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. You return, look at the logs, weed out the false positives, and then you make the next educated step. This is no wild, just plug it in and see what happens, and if it explodes, it's bad, and if it doesn't, then it's probably fine. You do one step at a time, and whatever you do, and every change you're issuing, you know exactly what's going to happen. And there will be very little surprises. Uh, Let's return uh, to the false positives. There is a, another cheat sheet, talk about this. There is a mod security uh, rule exclusion cheat sheet. So the problem with false positive is that rules are triggers when they shouldn't. And what you need to do is you need to exclude this rule in this given situation. Uh, I'm advocating uh, typically four types of of ways to achieve this. Uh, this is all documented in tutorials and you can also download the cheat sheet from my company website that they have it come. Uh, so four ways. One way is simply to rule, remove the ID, the rule by ID. It will be gone. The co complete rule is gone. But of course uh, there's probably more than what you want. If you think of the call rules as a wall made of bricks, you've just taken a big piece of it away. And what you usually to want is, you want the rule only disabled for an individual parameter, perhaps. The search field, typically, uh, free, text, free text entry field. And there you would, ru <coughs> you would uh, remove the, the parameter, the rule for a given parameter. And then you can also combine this with a given path. So you would only remove the rule on a given path. You do this at runtime, but these are details. I want to dive into that. Or you combine the two techniques. You remove the rule for a given path for a given parameter. So these are the four variants which I advocate. And the job when running the call rules in a higher paranoia level, reading out false positives, is finding a solution for these false positives. Doing this by hand is, uh, is fairly cumbersome. That's why I developed a uh, methodology how to do this and a set of scripts which help you uh, pull this off. So what the scripts are doing, they write the exclusions for you. You can see here already that it's, it's fairly cumbersome to write this because mod security rule writing is annoying and fairly tricky and the scripts do, do the writing for you. So they propose to you uh, so-called rule exclusions, which you then copy into your configuration, which helps you make a deal. And the course I'm running is, uh, is giving you 
a go with these uh, scripts helping you perform this and get the hang of it. Uh, and finally, because, before we come to the end, is set of rule exclusions. Um, so we know there are a couple of crazy uh, applications around. As it happens, uh, WordPress, and especially Drupal, they do crazy things. So things that look like vulnerability, but they're actually standard behavior of Drupal. What Drupal would do is, it has random cookie names with random values. And it, could ha it can happen, because they're random, that they resemble uh, attack patterns. And uh, uh, given that the cookie name is also random, <laughs> it's fairly hard to detect or disable a rule. So we know when we run Drupal, we need to disable, especially a paranoia level 2, we need to disable a set of rules which will break Drupal. That's a given. So we develop a set uh, of rule solutions for specific applications. We started with uh, Drupal core and the WordPress default install. And in the CRS uh, setup conf, which uh, I uh, copied in the installation demo, inside this file you can enable this, these exclusions. And then with this you tell your web server or you tell mod security, look, uh, I'm running Drupal and don't get on my nerve with the crazy shit. <laughs> and uh, we have more of this in the queue, Typo3. Uh, have to admit this guy down a bit, my Typo3 partner, uh, I think he, got, he, he gave up on this project, he got a new job. And I developed a, a PBIT, uh, PBIT is a Google Analytics open source alternative, uh, default install rule set. And we need more people to uh, help us develop these rule sets, because we're not experts in, in Joomla or uh, any other special application, <coughs> off-the-shelf application, where people might want to run uh, mod security with. So this is an area where we really welcome uh, contributions. And if you want to help develop such a set, we're really open to work with you because we know how to handle false positives, but we don't know your application. And together we can develop a set which should uh, ease the pain on people running the core rules with set applications. Good. So let me summarize. Uh, the mod security core rules set it's a first line of defense against web attacks. It's a generic set of blacklisting rules for roughs. So it knows a bit about attacks. It tries to identify them and tries to block them. Uh, it prevents 80% of web attacks with minimal false positives. I think we can really make this claim. And it gives you very granular control on individual parameters, which helps you tailor the configuration to your specific service and give this a maximum protection. And uh, with the help of the paranoia levels, you can really push the security level that mod security can bring you uh, to very high level. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, Excellent. This was me. Uh, Thanks. All for a second. So I'm Christian for me. I just broke your 500 Twitter followers today. Uh, if I go to 550, I'll be very happy. Uh, most of what I've uh, explained today can be found on my company website, uh, namely uh, over 10 Apache mod security tutorials are to be found there. You can find this also via the OWASP site. And I'm running a mod security course in London in October. So if, you, uh, if I caught your interest with this presentation, we have a couple of seats uh, available. I'd be very happy to see you in my course. It's a two-day course where we go from very or almost zero level of knowledge from zero to hero in two days. After two days, you'll be able to run Paranoia Level 4 and handle the false positives because exercises with false positives is really what is difficult about running this. And it would be great to see you in the pub afterwards. Uh, I'd like to party about the book a bit. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to put up a picture of a pub on the screen while Sharif uh, takes the questions. I think we have time for two questions only, and then we'll go to the pub. Okay, well, you can you. So, uh, first, uh, 
Hi, thank you very much, Christian. Um, it reminds me of a WASP app sensor, but I guess the, the difference, if I've understood this right, is it, it kind of wraps around the web application server rather than inside the application code. Is, is yes, that right. yeah. we're a bit further off from the application. So a reverse proxy, it's usually running on the reverse proxy, about, it is in front of the application on the separate server. And, uh, and I try to explain, we don't really understand the application. So we try to guess with regular expression what is going on here, which leads to problems, things we cannot detect because the application uh, interprets the request differently from what we assume. So we're a bit further off than uh, the OWASP project. So, so would having uh, mod security and uh, OWASP app sensor at, at the same place, um, the same uh, system, uh, be an overkill at the same rule set or the rules significant? Uh, it could be overkill. It, re it really depends. Uh, I haven't run the two together, so I can really tell you. Uh, I think it, it has to be part of your threat model or your software development lifecycle where you define exactly what project or software should protect from what attack or uh, attack vector. Thank you very much. Is that over? That's fine. Before I hand over the second question, I have a feature request. Can you create a Jenkins plugin so I can run my regression pack mm -hmm. against um, for at least a critical path for my application, like the booking, sign-in, and so on? And uh, the Jenkins plugin eventually creates the pack that will get, avoids false positives, basically finds what triggers and tells you, and here's a rule pack that will not trigger against that specific thing. I wrote this down. Mm -hmm. There are uh, a couple of... Uh, of blog posts online done by Trustwave where they've pulled similar things off. Mm. So where they develop rules which generate rules, uh, it's a bit of a, in the direction of machine learning. And uh, I think that would be a base to build upon. But I think it was never, it was more of a proof of concept. Yeah, yeah. this thing is really, really stupid. Run this traffic. <laughs> is a, if a rule has a flag to block it, suppress it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one, one last question. Okay, so uh, we're running uh, like hundreds of web servers, with, uh, web applications uh, in our data centers, and, uh, and now uh, to be able to set up uh, uh, mod security on all the servers will probably be difficult to scale. So I thought, okay, if you want to do it in the parameter, just in front of all of the applications, but then all the web applications are uh, with data certificates, with something like, uh, you know, public key pending enabled, and so all traffic is going through HTTPS. So uh, what is the best way to kind of, in a scalable way, to have more security inspect that traffic is sitting in the ground? Okay, I, I have um, customers who terminate the SSL on, uh, on the low balancer, and then the next box is a reverse proxy with more security on top. But I generally advocate to terminate the SSL on the reverse proxy together with more security because the traffic will be the freshest for mod security. So we're closest to the SSL, and we could even think of setups where the SSL information about the client helps mod security to make a better decision. So I would generally say, try to install mod security where you terminate the encryption in front of your replication. And that's what was hundreds of certificates for each application on the server where mod security is sitting. Uh, can be a typical setup. Uh, it depends. I have a, uh, my m most important uh, customer. I work as a contractor or a security consultant. They have 500 Apache instances over 110 uh, different applications. And the instances are always for one or a couple of closely related applications, uh, a single Apache instance, or like two of them with a certificate for this application. And then on the same uh, server, a separate Apache daemon for the next uh, application. So I think that, that is, a, I think, a, a setup which is easy to operate because they're still fairly separate. And then you need your DevOps tools to deploy this and handle it, obviously. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, right, if you, I know you have more questions. I certainly have more questions. You can ask them all in the pub in a few minutes' time. Yep. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to our speakers, to Christian and to Lewis. Yeah, thank you very much.
respect to, to our hosts, to Just Eight and Kevin Field at the CSO for this amazing venue. We find out all slides, all presentations will be published on OWASP.org. The videos will also be uploaded onto YouTube where you can watch them at a later date. And here is the pub we're all going to go to now. The Vitek Tower, there's a picture. It's across the road. If you head back towards the polls. Thank you very much and we'll see you in September. Check if you guys are okay to be submitting the Queen's Law. I can't guarantee you get it. No, 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 no. Thank you. We've actually we looked at it. Uh, we just want to make sure that it's done the right way. That you know, obviously, it's independent, so we're not involved in it in the right way. Uh, Uh, a review note, and 